everyone good afternoon and um welcome to our last um ccc oer webinar for um the spring semester my name is regina gong i am the oer project manager here at lansing community college in michigan and I also serve as one of the um, CCC OER Executive Council uh, members. And I am the Vice President for Professional Development. Um, for today, our topic would be, um, is regional uh, models for OER implementation? And um, before I let you um, hear from our um, guests, I'll talk about our agenda for today. So we'll start with the introductions and then um, I'll let our speakers introduce themselves. Then I'll talk about an overview of CCCOER as an organization and then we'll dive right into the presentations of our um, speakers and then we'll have panel discussions and questions and answers that you might have for our um, guests for today. Okay. So um, here are our speakers, and I'll let them introduce themselves to you. So let's start with you, Bill. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Bill Hemmig, Dean of Learning Resources and Online Learning at Bucks County Community College, which is in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, I'm also part of the Affordable Learning PA project, which is why I'm here today. Um, at Bucks, uh, we are in the third year of our OER initiative, and we have about 30 courses running now with, um, with OER sections, and we're just starting to look into the feasibility of our first C degree. So that's pretty exciting, and um, I'll talk to you some more later. Thank you, Bill. And Jenny? Can you hear me? Yes. Good. I, I had a, a mute issue. Hi, my name is Jenny Parks, and I am the Director of Academic Leadership Initiatives at the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. We are one of the four regional higher education compacts in the nation. We are entities created in statute by our member states, so we are designed um, to help our in, the institutions in our states um, do things more affordably and it's my job over the last year and for the next few years to help them do that with OER and so I'll be telling you more about that in a few minutes. Thank you Jenny and um, Tanya. Hi everyone my name is Tanya Spillavoy. I work at a different regional compact uh, at the Western Interstate Compact for Higher Education. It's all the western states in the technology department called WCET. Uh, there I'm, I serve as the director for open policy. I also have a, di a, a different role that you may have seen me play on Twitter and um, with the Spark Open Education Leadership Program. I, I co-designed the Open Education Leadership Program for OER librarians and we're just graduating our second cohort. I also teach um, that program and my, my creative partner in that is Nicole Allen. So we're very proud of the um, implementation of both the states that I work with and uh, the librarian leaders. Thank you, Tanya. And we'll hear more about our awesome speakers um, in a little bit. Um, but first, let me introduce um, CCCOER to you. Um, if you've been a regular attendee of our webinar, um, you know about um, the CCCOER mission. Um, we are actually a community of practice dedicated to the promotion um, of the adoption and development of OER um, across community colleges. And this is with the goal of enhancing teaching and learning. Um, we were founded to support the community college mission of open access through the creation um, for creating awareness and development of openly licensed, low-cost educational materials. Um, we provide regular one um, online and face-to-face -face, um, workshops for faculty and staff who are engaged in um, OER projects. And here are our membership figures as of spring 2019. 
We now have 83 members in 34 states. And as you can see, you know, we are really um, represented um, across, um, you know, the U.S. And we also have 15 statewide um, membership. And you can view more or you can learn more about our membership um, if you go to our website at cccoer.org slash member. And um, just a little uh, overview of what we are going to discuss today. Um, really the collaboration to advance and promote OER has been um, on the rise as of late. So we see a lot of statewide collaboration and Bill will speak about that with collaboration that is happening um, in, in Pennsylvania. But I think what is um, unique also that is happening around um, collaboration with OER is um, the multi-state collaboration that um, is led by our compacts. And um, Jenny and Tanya will be talking about that because I think it is interesting. And I just tweeted about that a while ago. There really is spent in numbers. So I hope um, we get to engage more um, with the topic that we are going to discuss today because I think it really is interesting. So um, we'll start with Bill talking about um, the collaboration in Pennsylvania. I'll stop sharing and I'll let Bill show his slide. So there's going to be a few seconds of transition, so bear with us. Just looking for the right screen to share. I'll be with you in a moment. And there we go. All right, Regina, is this visible? Yes, we can see your screen really well, Bill. Great. Thank you. I'll start, thank you. Um, yes, hello again, everybody. Um, Affordable Learning Pennsylvania, we are nearing the end of year two of this project. Um, I actually didn't come on board until midway through year one as one of four OER special, uh, four volunteer OER specialists, but I'll talk about those roles a little bit uh, later. Uh, first, a little bit background into why we're doing this. Um, Pennsylvania is a very higher ed rich state. Uh, we have about 150 public and private colleges and universities, including 14 community colleges. Um, in the Philadelphia region alone, there are more than 60 colleges and universities. Um, by and large, not highly organized. Uh, we're, we're all kind of um, doing our individual things. Uh, the Pennsylvania state system of higher ed includes only 14 universities out of those 150 institutions in the state. And prior to just a few years ago, none of these institutions was really collaborating with the others on textbook affordability. So there's lots of potential for it, but there was no collaboration or even really any sense of who's doing what where. In 2016, uh, Stephen Bell at Temple University got together a small group under the guidance of the Pennsylvania Academic Library Consortium, um, known as PALSI to its friends and close associates, uh, to develop a statewide initiative and seek out grant funding for it. From the beginning, this has always been a very library-driven uh, project. Uh, they organized a steering group and figured out an organizational structure. As part of that process, PALSI became a consortial member of the Open Textbook Network and originally used that connection as a means of reaching out to other consortial members to try and get some ideas for organizing structures. The group received state funding through the Library Services and Technology Act, LISTA, and um, Affordable Learning PA began. Um, the goal was and is to build a community of practice, 
to advance textbook affordability to students, create awareness, build expertise, and promote best practices and collaboration in the community, which was a tall order for a lot of institutions that really hadn't been talking about this with each other at all. Uh, the project goals, increased participation in OER initiatives. Originally, we were, hope, we were hoping to engage at least 30 of those 150 institutions, uh, create a program that would save our students money, increase awareness and knowledge of OER, especially among faculty uh, with librarians and students as the advocates. Again, as I said, this is a very library uh, initiated project. In the first year, 2018, uh, the steering group created a governance structure and started the people working together. And the governance structure really came out, out of a lot of conversations that the steering group had had with other consortial members of OTM. And this is a diagram of the governance structure. Uh, you can see the steering group here. The project coordinator was hired by PALSI to work with the steering group. And then four OER specialists were recruited. Campus partners at interest, interested institutions were identified and working groups were planned. The working groups were to focus on three topics, data gathering and assessment, communications and outreach, and training and education. And these working groups will be made up of campus partners. A little bit more on the campus partners. Um, they were responsible for serving as their institutional liaison to the ALPA project. We asked for an initial, at least two year commitment um, with the possibility of continuing. Um, their responsibilities included um, ALPA training programs and meetings, um, organizing and conducting OER training for people at their own institutions, and also, as I said, was serving on at least one of the three working groups. Qualifications basically amounted to enthusiasm. Um, they could be, again, because of the library focus here, uh, we were looking for campus partners who were members of the library staff or faculty or of library appointed designates. And also we were looking not necessarily for OER experience, although that would be nice, um, but at least a desire to learn more about OER, some experience with teaching and training, and all of it also a demonstrated advocacy ability. Because these would be the people responsible for promoting OER on their campuses. We have had a lot of success with this so far. If you remember a minute ago, I said that we were initially hoping to get 30 or more campus partners. As of today, we have 69 campus partners from, I think, about 63 institutions across the state and actually a little bit beyond. Um, because PALSI has some members that are just outside the borders of Pennsylvania, we do have a few campus partners from New Jersey and West Virginia, but nearly all of these are Pennsylvania institutions. And 11 of them are um, community colleges. Uh, we have 11 of the 14 community colleges participating in the project, which is terrific. We had to actually do a little additional outreach um, to get some of these. Um, not every institution in Pennsylvania is a member of PALSI, including many of the community colleges. And the steering group was always concerned, although they were aligned with PALSI and PALSI is administering the project, we wanted to make sure that we were getting the word out to those non-PELSI members so we could get them involved as well. So that happened. And also I did some individual outreach to these schools um, to try and get as many of them on board as possible. Uh, the OER specialists, as I mentioned, I'm one of four OER specialists appointed in the first year and the only one representing a community college. Uh, the four of us were sent to the OTN Summer Institute and Summit last July for train the trainer experience. And we serve as the, we now serve as the project liaisons to the campus partners in our regions. 
This year, we're now in year two, um, we did a survey of the campus partners to get all that information that we didn't have when all of this started. So where they're at with OER promotion and adoption at their institutions, what their particular interests are and how the campus partners could best help them in furthering those interests and aims. Um, we did start a webinar series. We've had three so far and we are in the process of setting up those working groups. We had a lot of um, volunteers from the campus partners, ne nearly all of them volunteered for at least one working group. Uh, we just recently identified the second cohort of four OER specialists who will be a train, uh, excuse me, who will be attending the OTN Summer Institute next month and then they will be brought into the fold um, to help the original four of us take on um, all of those 69 campus partners. And we are now in the process of planning our uh, first Pennsylvania OER Summit scheduled for August 9th, um, the theme of which is appropriately building a community. So we're very excited about getting that going. And beyond that, um, we're just really optimistic about a third year of funding um, to keep all of this going. And there's my email address if you wanna um, contact me individually after this. Um, otherwise, I will keep my eye on the chat. And um, th thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, Bill. Um, we're now gonna do some screen sharing again. And let's see. Share. Okay, let me just, oops. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so um, I think we can start with Tanya now. Tanya? Hi everybody, this is Tanya and I'm going to talk about some of the features of state and regional OER initiatives. First of all, I love to share and I think we can all do a lot better at sharing what we do well and learn from each other's mistakes. Um, so some of the things that would be great and some of the things that are going really well about state and regional OER initiatives is that people can learn from other states and other champions. What is going well, what's not going well. And at the very high levels at the state um, and regions, they can do a lot of support for the grassroots efforts that are happening at the campuses already. So we recognize that there's champions on campuses. We have fantastic faculty. We have librarians that are doing amazing work with OER. Um, and at the state and multi-state level, there is opportunity to support grassroots efforts through policy, through funding, uh, through some really high level support. Maybe um, you need more FTEs or instructional designers or things that, that um, the folks who make some of those really big decisions can help with. Um, and there's also opportunity to share what works and doesn't work. So not just to duplicate um, the things that are going well, but also say, hey, we tried this and it was a complete disaster. We would have done it differently if we could have started over. And so um, let's say a state has implemented course markings and it took them a lot of work and effort to do something like that uh, across the state system. Another state could use their um, hints and their, and their excellent uh, learnings from that initiative and then do it faster, smarter, better, um, just to get through the work a lot quicker instead of everybody starting from zero. So it really reduces duplication of effort and it increases the ability for us to search for not only OER um, textbooks and resources, but also search for things like a grant example 
or a, an entire grant program or how people structured their um, initiative in a, in a region or in a state. Um, so the features of state and regional OER initiatives are really to encourage state funding and support for OER. And there's also such a huge opportunity to collect data in a more strategic and unified way. So I'll, for one example of that might be um, cost savings data. Uh, there's a lot of different ways people are doing cost savings data. Um, and it's, it's almost like you have to go in and ask, well, how exactly did you get to these numbers? And there might be opportunity for states or groups of states to discuss a more unified system of, of cost savings data reporting, and then also student focused research. So we have um, some really great large scale efforts coming out of Georgia um, that I'll talk about in the, in the next slide. Um, and of course, John Hilton and the OER fellows are doing a fantastic job um, working on student efficacy data, but um, not, there isn't so much student efficacy data available about OER across multi-states. Um, and so there's just a lot of opportunity uh, around um, collaboration among states and across states. So next I'd like to share the next slide and talk about a few of the states that are doing um, some great things. And I appreciate Bill's feature of his work. So the next state I'd like to talk about is the state of North Dakota. I led this initiative and I like to feature North Dakota because it's kind of off the beaten path from what people really think of. It has very few students in the state. It's got a large land span. So people are geographically isolated many times um, and they got a really small investment. I got a really small investment from state lawmakers of only $107,000 after the allotment. So I really didn't have a lot of money to work with. However, what we found from really being strategic, um, planning well and not spending a lot of money on things that didn't affect students. So when I um, worked toward grants in my state, I really focused on what would get the biggest effect for my students in the state. And North Dakota is the first and only state so far that has had a state auditor audit the OER initiative. And he said he was a really conservative auditor on this. And you can look more into that if you're interested about how they conducted the audit report in the state of North Dakota. Um, it's through uh, the state auditor's office as Josh Gallion. And there was also a write up about the efforts in Inside Higher Ed and so we can make those, um, those materials available to you later. But they found even with a very conservative estimate that with a small investment, um, students in North Dakota saved between one and $2 million just in the first year. So those, I expect that to really continue on. Um, and then we found researchers within the state discovered that students had same or better learning outcomes um, as a result of purely OER materials. So these were, courses that used OER only. Um, and then auditors made recommendations that could be scaled across to other states and great recommendations about um, producing high savings and high enrollment general education courses. They urged the system to ensure that students know during the registration process which courses will include OER materials. And so this is a great example if you're looking to find research on purely OER courses. So the next state I'll talk about is the Affordable Learning Georgia, Affordable Learning Georgia initiative. And this is one of the ones that has been around since 2013. So North Dakota, when I started, um, Jeff was doing it about the same time that I was. And so, uh, He's really, they really had a nice, long and very successful OER project in the state of Georgia. Um, they've had a lot of support from their institutions and from their state. And they've awarded between 80 and $100,000 in grants for institutions per year. 
Um, they have an online core curriculum. They do a lot of events and professional development, and they just have an excellent leader who's the champion at the state level. And so um, this has been a great project for other states to look to. They have LMS integration, they have designated champions, and they're really affecting a lot of students in all these different places. And one of my favorites is the um, Affordable Learning Georgia um, large scale uh, research that came out um, by Colvard and Watson about um, that they found that students who are Pell eligible did better in OER courses. And I just, I love the large scale of the Georgia initiative. The next one I wanna talk about is one that's very recent. Um, so I was the state, uh, um, I was the person that the OER council asked to come into the state and help as a consultant for their OER um, surveys, reports, and strategy. Um, it was a very exciting moment in the state of Colorado, and since um, I helped them in 2017 and 18, they have just really done a great job in the state of Colorado. So as a result of three statewide surveys and a large report um, that got in a lot of input from a variety of stakeholders, we found that over 6,000 students um, responded to the survey. So there was just so much engagement with students and faculty and um, the whole community really rallied around um, getting data and support for OER in the state of Colorado. Um, and we just saw a statewide OER summit in, the, in May, just a few days ago, and the governor, Jared Polis, attended, and they had other lawmakers there. So there's, it's a really great and hopeful project that, that other states can look to. Um, and a large part of that is because they had this wonderful OER council. They had a great um, SHEO officer at the CDHE, Kim Hunter-Reed at the time and um, brought together librarians, faculty, technologists, system employees, and students, and they had um, other OER experts come in from around the states to give them advice, and they've just done a awesome work. So if you move to the next slide, um, you can see that there are four regional compacts in the United States. Um, I'm in the Wichi region, and I also worked very closely to help MEC uh, in the in the yellow region do their OER initiative that Jenny will talk about next. Um, there's also two other regional compacts, NEBI and SRAD. And I, when I look across the United States and all these pockets of innovation, so many opportunities, wonderful champions, um, and there's a lot of people who just don't know how to get started or they don't know who to call or they know they need something, but someone else did it, but who was that person? There's just this opportunity for all of us to share more information, um, to share what we do best, to learn from each other. And I really think that with better coordination among states and systems of higher ed, as well as these multi-compact regions, um, we can all win. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jenny. Oh, and this is my, sorry, I forgot about my final picture. Um, I just wanted to say, these are the hands-on people that we brought into the conversation. You can see uh, legislators, technologists, librarians, OER advocates, Regina's in the picture, Jenny, me. Uh, so many awesome people, people who were new to OER, people who um, were experts in OER, and we brought them all together for the MEC Summit that um, Jenny's going to talk about next. And she's really the expert for her region, so um, take it away, Jenny. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Regina, for um helping me with my slides. So as I said, I'm Jenny Parks, the Director of Academic Leadership Initiatives at the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. And my job for the last year has um, focused heavily on implementing um, processes and programs that will help um, 
the institutions in our states adopt and create and otherwise implement OER more effectively and at higher levels. So if Regina, if you'll give me my next slide. So um, as Tanya said, we are the Midwestern region. These are the MEX states here that you're seeing on this slide. The kind of work we do is um, based exactly on the model that um, Tanya talked about, which is based on sharing success, um, sharing strategies. We do a lot of network and sharing. So what we've been able to create um, in the last six months is um, a regional OER newsletter, a list server, and we have a series of webinars that we're creating. In fact, interestingly, um, our last webinar was about different ways of calculating cost savings and actually um, the North Dakota auditor and that process was part of that webinar. So you could take a look at our website if you want to hear those people talk about the way they did their study. Um, as she said, we started, we kicked it off with a large convening in Chicago in November 2018, to which we invited um, up to five members of a team from each of our states. I'll tell you a little bit more about who, were, who the people who were on those teams. And um, since that time, we've been having monthly phone calls. We've been trying to share our, um, our ideas across states, within states, et cetera. Um, and we now are starting on July 1st, another 12 month plan for MEC work with our states. The bulk of which is still supporting communications and sharing and convening. And of course, as Tanya mentioned, we do collaborate with the other regional compacts and continue to do that. Next. Um, if you wanted to find out more about what we're doing, you can go to our website and the OER page that will give you access again to the webinars, to some of the documents. Uh, there's an overview of the MEC work there, which will be updated in the next few weeks. So if you really want the, the most up-to-date information, wait till maybe the, the uh, beginning of July to take a look at that. Next. So I would say that the real strength of our approach has been what I call the MEC OER action teams. Um, these are the folks who came to the original summit in um, November of 2018, but it's also folks we've added since then. But the goal at that point was to access as widely and as, and as representatively as possible um, anyone in the state who has um, who's a stakeholder in, in education and in OER. So we had uh, representatives from SHIO offices, K-12 agencies, we had legislatures, legislators, we had students, faculty, librarians, administrators, sometimes we even have bookstore reps, anyone who can be a meaningful part of this conversation um, was had the potential to be invited. We couldn't invite as many people as we needed to, but since that time in a lot of the state teams, they have added to that original five. In some states, they've kept it very small as they're still trying to figure out how they want to scale their efforts. And in other, um, in other states, they've had the Board of Regents officially recognize their team and it's growing and it's got a membership process, et cetera. So we have a lot of variety in the ways that the states are handling it, which is something we always try to be respectful of. Um, it's gonna be a different educational and political climate everywhere. So we wanna facilitate states doing this the way that they find uh, most advantageous. And as I said, we provide support for their work in in the form of research, ideas, and hopefully looking um, to help them find some funding as well. Next. Um, so in the last six months, we, we had our convening in November and every state team created a six month plan of the things they wanted to accomplish um, in the first half of 2019. And they've actually accomplished quite a lot. Um, some of the more notable accomplishments are um, four of the 12 have been able to make presentations to their legislatures um, in four, also in four, not the same four necessarily, in four states, they've had statewide surveys of the institutional OER work that's already happening. And this is the first time in a lot of these places that they've been able to gather that information. And so um, that's one of the big things that I see all the states wanting to do eventually is establish that baseline data and find out who's doing what, where, and who the best OER contact at each institution is. Um, we've also had several states where they've created um, a repository that others have now joined into, or there was an existing repository, usually and often with the um, 
the K-12 entity in the state, usually that's an OER Commons hub, and they have made that open and available to members of the higher ed committee. So one of the things that is happening in a lot of the states is that they are moving toward a single repository where you're going to have continuity between K-12 and higher ed, and you're going to have a common set of protocols for metadata, for um, how you know, if something needs to be removed or if something needs to be updated, they're going to have that consistency across the state, which we feel will build in the capacity for, for more work and higher quality work. And then there were several states where they did not have a pre-existing relationship with OTN and or OpenStax. And so we've been able to facilitate some of that and we'll continue to do that and to continue to connect them with other national efforts, um, national conferences, the research base, all of those types of things. We're trying really hard just to create capacity. I would say that's really our strategy. Capacity is the, is the main goal. Our next steps, of course, are to continue supporting and doing our networking work for um, our states. Um, we also want to work on some additional convenings. We would love to be able to contribute to a state level summit or convening in each of our states, um, but that will depend on what kind of funding we can find. And um, also we would love to do another regional convening. Um, and then again, I'm working on some more specific plans that hopefully you'll be able to read about um, when I update all of that information on our website. If you have any more questions, please let me know. Um, Jenny Parks, the Director of Academic Leadership at MAC. And I'll give it back to Regina for our panel discussion. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenny, Tanya, and Bill. Um, what an awesome discussion of what's happening um, statewide and multi-state. Um, haven't been able to see the chat, so I don't know if we have questions, but in the meantime, um, I have a question and, um, you know, any, any one of you can answer it. Um, what are the challenges that um, you see as you implement um, state and multi-state OER collaboration? And any one of you can start. Hi, Regina, this is Jenny. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges at the beginning has been just coming from, from a position that is not within any particular state, and it's identifying the key actors. And mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's not uncommon for you to approach someone at a state level leadership position, especially the SHIO officers, and they don't necessarily, because it, it, and it makes sense, it's not really the type of thing that has risen um, to their um, radar, you know, it's not on their radar yet, but it was really hard to identify the people who needed to be at the table to have these discussions. And that's one of the things the, um, all of the teams continue to struggle with is how do we make sure that everyone who needs to be a part of this conversation is a part of this conversation because people are doing things off in, you know, on their own yeah. and um, it's, it's connecting all of those things. That was a major challenge for us at least. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Tanya too. I would just say um, one of the challenges for doing multi-state work and working with states in general is that not all states are exactly the same. So there's a yeah. lot of difference among states in terms of um, governance structure, how they interact with the legislature. Um, in one state, there might be multiple agencies that oversee different sectors of higher education. So there could be um, mm -hmm. one, you know, like in some states, like in North Dakota, there's just one CHEO office, State Higher ed Education Executive Office is at the North Dakota University System. But in the state of California, that's spread among multiple agencies that do multiple things for multiple systems. Um, and so every state has a bit different structure. And one thing that I think um, it makes it a little more complicated is that not everything works everywhere. So, uh, you know, you can say this is a great, this is a great thing that worked really, really well in Pennsylvania, and then it just will not translate completely like that and still has to be customized just a bit to say work in Montana or in another state. And so um, while uh, 
there are similarities among states and definitely uh, things that seem to be to make sense. It also <laughs> means that every new state is a different challenge. Every new system has its own special flavor, mm -hmm. student population, um, the way they structure their institutions. And so we really have to keep in mind that it's not simple, right? So mm -hmm. even though we're all sharing all these ideas, it's still complicated every time different people, different governance structure, different way of funding, legislatures meet different years, all kinds of things. So anyway, that's just a, that's a, that's definitely one of the barriers or one of the challenges. Yeah, well, thank you. And I have one for, for you, Bill. Um, so for Pennsylvania, do you have a mechanism in which you can track um, each of the institutions from um, OER adoptions? Uh, we, we're getting toward that now. Um, okay. we're, we're just in the process now of collecting information about where everybody is at with their initiatives. Um, I think we are going to have a system um, connected with the system that, that Open Textbook Network is already using uh, for tracking adoptions. We, we're almost at that point, but we're not quite there yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Um, Gina, I, I, yes. I, I'm sorry. I wanted to mention we did get a question in the chat window, and you mentioned you couldn't see it. So. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, so actually, I can see it. Is that from Sybil? Oh, wonderful. I'm glad you okay. can see it, and I'll, I'll yes. leave it. Yeah, and yeah, we have a question here from um, Sybil. It's um, and um, it says here it would be extremely cool and valuable and helpful to have state repositories. How can this be done? And or are these kinds of projects already in motion? Um, Sybil, I can speak before I turn it over to our speaker. I can speak um, with regards to what is happening here in Michigan. Um, actually. To, um, repositories. So it's it's still with OER Commons, but the first repository is with the MCO um, OER statewide steering committee, which is representative of all the 28 community colleges here in Michigan. So we were the first to have an OER repository of all OER um, that we use in our respective institutions. Um, and now, just last year, we have um, the K-12 through our state's participation so open. They now have their own um, microsite, actually, via OER Commons. So our goal, really, in our work here um, statewide in Michigan is to have a repository that includes um, all sectors in education, from K-12 to higher ed. And um, so what about you, um, Bill, or Kanya and Jenny? What can you um, say about um, the repository question? I do know that Pelsey is looking into it, but they've just started, and I don't have very much information about it. But I know they've been talking to another state. I want to say Ohio, but I could be wrong about that. Um, working um, together to, to come up with, uh, with a platform. But that's, that's about all I know at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Tanya, and I, I'm, I've always been a bit hesitant about um, state-branded OER repositories, only because um, I think it's somewhat duplicative to have everyone creating their own open repository um, if, if it's already free and available in another state. Um, but I, I do understand states would like to have their own branded uh, curriculums and at, Th those kinds of things. So um, when, I, when I work with states uh, and systems who are considering doing their own repository, I always recommend that they work very closely with librarians because you're the best at um, making sure that everything is searchable and findable and discoverable because um, it really does not help anyone to have a repository of stuff nobody can find. So there's plenty of that already out there that is undiscoverable and just somewhere in an archive. Um, and I, I, my best advice on anyone who's trying to do uh, their own repository is work with your librarian so that it's searchable and we can all use it and share it and you're not recreating something that's already been done in another state. 
Hi, Regina. This is Jenny. Um, so in, in some of our states where they are moving toward a central repository, they are definitely doing exactly, exactly what Tanya has recommended because we don't have an OER action team that doesn't have a lot of librarians on it and that's by design and very much on purpose. Um, so when they are looking at having state repositories, it's usually because one has already been established by one sector of the higher ed or even the K-12 community. And, mm -hmm. and rather than duplicating sites, rather than having all of these different places, they are wanting to pull their resources and their efforts in one place. And yes, one of the big things that they are very much discussing is how this, uh, how these sites become available, um, not just to folks in the state, but, you know, throughout the world because of the design of it. They're being very careful and methodical. So I'm really proud of that work. And that is a good caution that Tanya has given us. I can say the reason that a lot of states want it to be their own state repository is because a lot of times that is tied to the funding they get for their um, for their OER initiative if it's coming from the, some entity within the state. Um, and another reason is that they sometimes have, especially at the K-12 level, they have state um, curriculum requirements and so they need to adapt things and they want it living in their state um, and something that looks like it's official and, and indeed is in this case. So I don't know if that's helpful, but those are some of the things that I've observed. Yeah, and we also have one question here from Rhonda and I think it's for you, Bill. Um, Rhonda is asking um, benefits of having a membership with OTM. I just saw that. Um, yeah. I know, well, originally they joined so that the steering group had a network with which they could talk to other consortia about how they're set up, and they, they found that really valuable. But from my own perspective, I, OTN is really good at training people to go back to their institutions and promote adoptions. Yeah. Um, I, attempted, I attended the institute last summer, and I came away with a lot of, of really valuable stuff that I can use. And the training that they do is training that you can take away and take back to your own institutions to work with your own faculty. I, I think you do a really good job with that. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Um, and I see um, Suzanne um, in our chat, and she was saying that one big advantage of a state repositories that it makes it easier for faculty to reach out to each other for questions and collaborations. And yes, that is true. Um, because sometimes um, when you go to a big repository such as OER Commons and when you do a search, it just gives you an overwhelming number of um, results and it probably is harder for faculty or any of um, uh, educators that are interested in OER in your institution to find exactly what they are looking for. So, yeah. And, and one more thing um, while we're waiting for questions. Um, and for this is again for multi-state collaboration and also for a state collaboration. What do you see are the common asks that um, each of the states has been um, asking or advocating that you help with? Or institutions in case of um, Bill for um, Pennsylvania. Hi, Regina, this is Jenny. That's actually one of the things that I've been asking all my state teams um, mm -hmm. here towards the end of our first six months. And so, um, again, it's gonna be things that I've already mentioned, but the short list is, help us figure out repositories. Do we have one? Do we have many? And, and, and what's the best way to set one up? And that can mean a lot of things, whether it's, um, you know, again, it can be metadata, it can be um, what type of site it is, it can be protocols, and it can be um, OER creation platforms. There are a lot of pieces of that. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the states want to figure out how to host some type of statewide OER summit. They want to know how, how to organize it, how to bring people in, how to incentivize people. Um, we are higher ed compacts. Um, we are allowed to and love to serve the K-12 community, but we don't usually do that as much as we would like to. So on some of our state teams, 
all of the state teams either have a strong K-12 presence or want that. And so um, they are yearning for, um, for there to be this connection between K-12 and higher ed in the OER um, realm, especially with um, relation with relation to um, dual and concurrent enrollment courses. Um, and then a lot of them want some leadership training for um, institutional leaders, SHEO leaders, even legislators, because um, they want to be able to talk to them about their needs, about what's going on, and, and have them um, understand more thoroughly and more carefully what they want. And then they're just wanting to be a part of the national and international conversation. They need that community of practice. They need to understand that they're part of a movement, and, and that really energizes everyone and kind of makes all the efforts gel. Mm -hmm. So your question, Regina, was what are states asking? Yeah. Okay. So I actually, one of the things that came to mind when you said that was, um, I think so folks are struggling between the difference between the words affordable learning and OER in general. Yeah. They're also um, getting a lot of advertisement and pressure from companies who offer inclusive access and the deals look really good and mm -hmm. the prices are low um, I, and I think everyone in states um, wants to do the right thing for students so I don't you know everyone everywhere you go they're looking for a great solution to help their students do better um, including faculty who who just need help with their courses and there's a lot of confusion about mm -hmm. this difference between inclusive access, um, the term affordable learning and open educational resources. And that is a national conversation that needs to continue and that I don't have all the answers for yet. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, the, uh, the questions that I've been getting from the campus partners in my region are kind of very similar to those and kind of all over the map, um, depending on where, where they are with their own projects. Um, I get questions, people who are looking for advice on how to set up training on their own campuses, um, how to, some of them are actually participating in the OTN review process with some of their faculty and need some coordination there. Some people just want to know how to find OER in particular subjects. Um, some want to get started with publishing at their institutions, really, really all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Thank you, thank you. This has really been um, an informative and illuminating discussion around, um, you know, collaboration um, with OER. And um, please, you can still ask um, questions. We still have time, but I'd just like to um, go on and tell you more about um, some of the things that are happening with um, CCC OER. So um, you can stay in the loop and see upcoming conferences uh, by going to our website, cccoer.org, and there's a link there that says get involved. You can see upcoming conferences, um, you know, most notably would be the big one is in October, the Open Ed um, Conference. CCC OER members, um, a lot of them will be there and certainly um, we will be there. As I think um, Bill and Tanya and Jenny will, will, will be too. So if you want to meet them in person and you haven't met them yet, then that will be your chance. And also because CCCOER is a community of practice, we really have a robust mailing list and you can um, sign up if you aren't already in there. Again, you can go to um, the website and there's um, a section there that says community email. And um, we'll be happy to welcome you into that community of practice. And also we have, um, Spring webinar series. This is the fifth of our uh, webinar series for um, the spring. If you want to view any of our past webinars, they are archived. Um, if you go to ccc.oer.org and go to webinar, the archives are available there. Uh, both the PowerPoint slides and the um, recordings. So 
um, if there's something that interests you um, with the past webinars that we've done, feel free to, to come and um, check, check that out. Um, also, if you have um, additional questions, um, such as membership or any other assistance that CCC OER can um, extend to you, please don't hesitate to contact Una Daly, who's the Executive Director of CCC OER, um, Quill West, who is our um, uh, president, right, or outgoing president, um, and um, Liz Yata, our um, wonderful support for um, CCC OER. So again, I'd like to thank our um, panel for today, Bill um, Hemig, Jenny Parks, and Tanya Spilovoy for um, wonderful discussion that we have today. And um, feel free to reach out to them if you have any further questions about um, the multi-state and statewide collaboration. So thank you so much, and I hope to see you again soon and have a wonderful summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Regina. Thank you. Thank